live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I think this should go without saying, but when you're a fan of your school, or you're the athletic director of your school, you want all the teams in your school to win games. If both the basketball team and the football team are doing well, that's beneficial in so many ways. It boosts morale and makes you feel good. It increases the prestige of your school, which can lead to more national television opportunities and exposure, which can help academics and recruiting. It can increase ticket sales and attendance, which increases revenue, and increases the activity around local businesses around those venues, helping the local economy. You get the idea. You can probably think of a thousand other ways that I didn't mention here as to how this is helpful. If you're a Utah fan, and you have no ulterior motives like wanting a season to be so bad so you can finally fire a coach, you're not saying to yourself, I hope our football team is great this year, but gee, I really hope our basketball team sucks. When the football team is good, and the basketball team is good, even though they are two independent teams under the same school, it is a good thing. That is, most of the time. Because in 1995, amazingly enough, Utah's football team got completely screwed over because of how good their basketball team was. You would think that a good basketball team would have no impact on the football team's performance, but it had a direct impact that cost the school hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process, to the point where it actually may have been beneficial if the basketball team was bad. It's an incredibly stupid and bizarre situation, and we're going to take a deep dive into that today. This is the story behind the Utah Utes, the 1995 Copper Bowl, and the absolutely stupid and idiotic controversy involving their participation in bowl season. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand how good Utah's football team was, and what bowl game they thought they were going to be making because of it. The year was 1995, and the expectations were high for the Utah Utes and their football program. The year before, in 1994, they were one of the best teams in all of college football, putting together their best season in program history at the time. Utah finished the 1994 season with a 10-2 record, which was the most wins they ever accumulated in a season. They won the Freedom Bowl, which was just their third bowl win in program history, and their first since 1964 when they won the Liberty Bowl. And they finished the season ranked number 10 in the AP poll, making it their first time ever that they were ranked in that poll to end the season. Many people believed, and rightfully so, that even though Utah was losing a good chunk of their offense that finished 7th in Division 1A in 1994, losing their starting quarterback Mike McCoy, their starting running back Charlie Brown, and their 11 touchdown receiver Curtis Marsh, that they would still be good, as this was a Ron McBride-led team, and McBride had taken Utah from nothing to a team that made a bowl game in three straight seasons. He was one of the best coaches in the country. And sure enough, the 1995 season was looking like another highly successful one for the Utes, because even though they were nowhere near as good as they were in 1994, when they finished the season ranked inside the top 10, they were still an awfully good team. After two losses by one possession to Oregon and Stanford, both Pac-10 teams who were very good that season and made it to a bowl game, they played extremely well in conference play, making easy work of much of their opponents in the WAC. They finished conference play with a 6-2 record, which was tied for their best record in WAC play, and was the most wins they had in conference play since all the way back in 1930, when they won seven games in the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. They ended the season on a four-game winning streak, including a dominant 34-17 victory over BYU in their biggest rivalry game, the Holy War, in a game that wasn't even as close as the final score indicates. They went undefeated on the road, which is an unbelievably impressive feat, and they were playing their best football as the season was drawing to a close, scoring 104 points over their final three games for an average of just under 35 points per game. Utah was an awfully good team, and that goes without saying. And because of their great play, for the first time since 1964, they won a share of the conference title. Even in 1994, when they finished inside the top 10 of the AP poll, they didn't do this, as they came in a tie for second place alongside BYU and Air Force with Colorado State at 7-1 getting the championship. You could make the legitimate argument that in 1995, Utah was the best team in the WAC. 
And how it worked back in 1995 was that the WAC got two automatic bull bids. The champion of the conference got to play out in San Diego in the Holiday Bowl, while the runner-up got to play in the Copper Bowl down in Tucson. However, this gets a bit complicated when you only have two bowl spots and when you have four teams tied for first place at 6-2. and two. Because alongside Utah, you had Colorado State, BYU, and Air Force. Two teams were going to be extremely unhappy. Colorado State got the Holiday Bowl bid, and it's not hard to see why. They had the best overall winning percentage in the conference, the best point differential in the conference amongst the four teams. They were playing their best football down the stretch, having won four straight games while allowing just 23 points over the final three games, and they even had a ranked win under their belt. I don't think anyone was up in arms about the Rams going back to San Diego for another season to take on Kansas State out of the Big 8. They earned that spot. So now, it was down to one of three teams for the WAC spot in the Copper Bowl. BYU, Utah, or Air Force. And if things weren't looking up for Utah already, seeing as they beat BYU and Air Force, it got even better when the Copper Bowl said that under no circumstances were they taking BYU, since the Cougars played the game in 1994, and they didn't want a team going in back-to-back -back years, since that would impact the attendance. If you want to learn more about why that is, click the card in the upper right corner. They were adamant about that through the entire season, and saw no reason to change their stance, especially after Utah thrashed BYU in the Holy War, with Larry Brown, the Copper Bowl Executive Director, saying that BYU wasn't even an option. It was now just down to Utah and Air Force, and especially since Utah won the head-to-head, -head, and since Utah advocated and pushed hard to play in this game, it had to be the Utes, right? By every metric, on the field, off the field, you name it, they deserved it. Which is why it came as a shock and a disappointment to every Utes fan that when the Copper Bowl announced the team that they were taking out of the WAC, that it was Air Force who got the spot. And no one at Utah could understand why, or at least think of a good reason why it happened. Senior safety and the team's leading tackler, Jeff Kirkman, said on the announcement, Things happen for a reason. I'm just waiting to find out why this time. It's pretty disappointing. And he wasn't the only one. Athletic director Chris Hill said, We finished as whack champs. We deserve to go to a bowl. We were playing our best at the end. Just like that, Utah's season came to a disappointing end, as they were snubbed. A chance at national television exposure and keeping their bowl streak alive? Gone. A $10,000 bonus for head coach Ron McBride? Gone. A final game for the seniors that they earned? Gone. And a month's work of practices? Gone. This snub was a devastating blow to a Utah team that felt, and rightfully so, that they earned a spot in the game. However, the Copper Bowl came up with a justification for why they made this tough call. What was the ultimate factor? The reason Utah didn't make it to the Copper Bowl and lost out on a gigantic payout, I kid you not, was because of their basketball team. That's right. It had nothing to do with the performance and the merits of the football team. It had everything to do with their basketball team. Without even going any further, this sounds incredibly absurd that of all things, a basketball team could keep a football team out of a bowl game. But don't worry, it's as absurd as it sounds. And even when I explain it, it is still going to seem highly unfair and nonsensical. Back in the 90s, Utah had one of the best college basketball teams in the country. They won a game in the NCAA tournament in three of the past five years, even making it to the Sweet 16 during the 1990-91 season. And during the 1994-95 season, they went 28-6, won the WAC, and made it to the second round of the tournament. There was no reason to expect Utah, who finished the season ranked inside the top 20 and was a top 10 team in the preseason poll, to be bad during the 1995-96 season, as they were looking like they were once again going to be one of the best teams in the entire country. And because Utah had a game on the day of the Copper Bowl, the Copper Bowl committee felt that Utah fans would be more invested in the basketball game than the football game, which would impact attendance and the TV ratings. Because the basketball team was good, the football team got screwed over, and got screwed out of hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process. That was literally the reason why Utah didn't get to play in the Copper Bowl like they thought they would. So you might be asking yourself, okay, that sucks, and that's entirely unfair. But who was this basketball game against? Was it a game against a ranked opponent or a big in-state rival? 
If that was the case, then as much as I hate it, maybe it might make sense. Obviously, it doesn't happen like this because that's just not how the schedule works, but if hypothetically, Duke was playing North Carolina in basketball on the same day that Duke was going to play in a bowl game, I can see why the bowl committee would have second thoughts, because I can see how Duke fans might be a bit more preoccupied with that game than a random bowl game. So who was Utah playing in this game, which was so important that the Copper Bowl was willing to snub them out of fear that their fans would be watching that instead? They were playing at home against Cal. Alright, I still think it's stupid, but playing a Pac-10 team is a pretty big deal. Plus, Cal was ranked inside the top 25 of the preseason poll, so you have a battle of two of the top 25 teams in the country entering the season. I don't think that's a good enough reason to keep Utah out of a bowl game, but I at least get- wait, wait, hang on. I'm being told something by my producer. Stand by. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, come on, you're kidding me. Okay, I'll let him know. So, uh, guys, I made a mistake. Utah wasn't playing Cal that day. They were playing Cal State Fullerton. Cal State Fullerton, as in the team that went 7-20 the year before. As in a team that Utah scheduled as a guarantee game of sorts. As in a team that ended the 1994-95 season by losing 10 of their final 11 games. As in a team that Utah was expected to absolutely throttle and blow the doors off of. This was the reason that Utah was left out of a bowl game. Does that not sound absurd? Using that Duke example from a minute ago, that's like saying you're keeping Duke out of a bowl game because their basketball team has a game against UNC Asheville that day. Literally no one cares. Utah is going to blow out Cal State Fullerton by 50. They're going to run them out of the building. You left them out of a lucrative bowl game for that? You're going to deny Utah $750,000 which is what each participating team in the Copper Bowl got. For that, that's so unfair and so not right. If there was one saving grace, the Copper Bowl wasn't exactly regretting their decision to send Air Force to the game, as the game between the Falcons of Air Force and the Red Raiders of Texas Tech was a thrilling high-scoring contest that Texas Tech won by a final score of 55-41. to And the game drew a crowd of 41,004, making it, of the seven Copper Bowls played thus far, the third highest attended game, and of the four Copper Bowls played between two unranked teams, the highest attended Copper Bowl of the bunch. It wasn't like other bowl games I've talked about on this channel where they made a controversial decision and instantly regretted it. From an on-the-field and an off-the-field perspective, everything worked out for the Copper Bowl at the end of the day, so no one was losing too much sleep over how it played out. Having said that, how the Copper Bowl came to that decision is utterly baffling and insulting because the Copper Bowl taught us a very valuable and unfair lesson on this day. It didn't matter if you won head-to-head -head against your competition. It didn't matter if you were the better team and deserved it more. Sometimes, outside forces can screw you over. And in this case, the outside force was Utah's basketball team being too good and too important. No one should ever have to root against a team in their own athletic department, but that's what the Copper Bowl committee was saying that Utah would have had to do in order to make it. Because this entire justification for why Utah didn't go bowling, all because their basketball team had a guarantee game on the same day, was flagrantly foul. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.